Sergeants, you may begin in your recordings. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Sadowski, send us off. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Rules, <clears throat> Privileges, and Elections. At this time, would all council members and staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. Thank you, and we are ready to begin. Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to this virtual meeting of the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections. My name is Karen Koslowitz, and I am chair of this committee. <clears throat> Before we begin, I would like Um, does anyone else have uh, Chair Kozlowitz frozen? Yes, uh, yeah. same thing here. Okay. Um, Lance, can you reach out to her? Yes, I will. Yeah. Lance, should we remain on live or? Would you like to? The just... committee hearing can stand at ease. Perfect. Thank you. While we're at ease, can we do a sound test on the uh, commissioner? I was having trouble hearing him before. Um, can can Mr. Jose Araujo uh, please unmute and do a sound check? And Mr. Stanley Richards as well. Uh, Jose Araujo speaking. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Stanley Richards speaking. Okay, thank you.
Hello. We hear Hi, you. Member. We hear Can you. you hear, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, I'm gonna have to do it from my phone. Okay. Mm. Okay. Um, so can you restart from the top? We we didn't hear any of it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Good morning and welcome to this virtual meeting of the Committee on Rules, Privileges and Elections. My name is Karen Koslowitz and I am chair of this committee. Before we begin, I would like to introduce the members of the Rules Committee present. Uh, we're going to be joined, I can't see if we were joined by Speaker Corey Johnson, Minority Leader Steve Amadio, Council Member Adrian Adams, Council Member Rory Lansman, and Council Member Debbie Rose, Council Member Richie Torres, and Council Member Mark Trago. I would also like to acknowledge Rules Committee Council Lance, I hope I get this right, Polivi, and the staff members of the council's investigative unit, Chuck Davis, Chief Compliance Officer, and Andre Johnson Brown, Alicia Vassell, and Ramses Booten investigators. We will consider the nomination of Stanley Richards for appointment to the Board of Corrections, followed by the nomination of Ho Jose Irajo for Queens County Democratic Commissioner of the Board of Elections. Should, should Mr. Richards receive the advice and consent of the council, he will be eligible to serve the remainder of a six year term that expires on October 12th, 2026. Should Mr. Arajo receive the advice and consent of the council, he will be reappointed to a four year term that will begin on January 1st 2021 and expires on December 31st, 2024. Chuck Davis, our Chief Compliance Officer, has briefed all members of this committee regarding the contents of each candidate's background investigation. The New York City Department of Correction provides for the care, custody, and control of persons accused or convicted of crimes and sentenced to one year or less of jail time. By law, the Board of Correction or BOC shall leave, have the power and duty to inspect and visit all institutions and facilities under the jurisdiction of the department at any time. Evaluate the department's performance, establish minimum standards for the care, custody, correction, treatment, supervision, and discipline of all persons held or confined under the jurisdiction of the department and establish procedures for the hearing of grievances and complaints. The Board of Correction is composed of nine members. Three members are appointed by the mayor, three by the council, and three by, and it says mayor again. On the nomination of the presiding justices of the appellate division of the Supreme Court for the first and second judicial departments. Members are appointed to six year terms and vacancies are filled for the remainder of an expired term. The mayor designates the chair of the BOC from among its members. Although the board members receive no compensation, they may however be reimbursed for expenses incurred in the performance of their duties. Welcome, Mr. Richards. Would you please raise your right hand to be sworn in? Mr. Richards, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Uh, do you have an opening statement, Mr. Richards? Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, Chairwoman Kaz. Uh, my apologies for um, not being able to- it, It's okay, they call me the Kaz, it's okay. I remember that at the uh, street naming for Adelaide. Uh, right. And other distinguished committee members. I am honored to be nominated uh, for this important and critically uh, valuable uh, position 
on the Board of Corrections. In 1986, 34 years ago, I sat in a dorm on Rikers Island in the AMKC, starting another cycle of jail and prison. My life at that time was filled with anger, hopelessness, and confusion, fueled by the desire to only survive. I accepted that narrative and belief that my life would be a never ending cycle of incarceration, release, and reincarceration. In 1988, almost two years in detention on Rikers Island, my time on Rikers ended and my four and a half to nine year prison term began. Shortly after entering prison, I found education and the beginning of a life I never thought was possible. I attended a GED class, passed and earned my GED. I then enrolled in Madaya College and found myself energized with the pursuit of knowledge and education. I soon graduated with my degree, magna cum laude, and started to believe that life could be different. I understood that my life was guided by my decisions and I had the power to achieve the outcome I wanted as opposed to living my life as the wind blows. Through education, I believe for the first time in my life that I was smart, intelligent, a good person and able to set and achieve goals. It was at that time, I believe prison was in my past and not in my future. Education in prison gave me the foundation to launch a new life and make amends for the hurt and devastation I leveled on my community in Soundview Houses. In 1991, New York State Department of Corrections released me to the community. Like thousands of men and women and young adults released from jail and prison, I applied to many jobs. Many people who interviewed me told me to get more experience, but no one was willing to give me the opportunity. That was true until I applied at the Fortune Society and met Joanne Page, president and CEO. In 1991, Fortune Society hired me as a counselor. My job was to engage people returning home from prison and support them <clears throat> as they transition back into the community. I was able to give someone a hand, pay it forward, and provide a different vision and narrative of what life after prison could be with hope, hard work, determination, and opportunity. Since 1991, I have been able to work on multiple levels in the non-for-profit field, specifically Fortune Society and Hunter College Center on AIDS, Drugs, and Community Health. I have had the opportunity to impact criminal justice system on multiple levels, including individual, community, and systemic levels. Joanne Page offered me the opportunity to work on every management level within Fortune. Supervisor, manager, director, senior director, and now executive. I also had the privilege to work with Dr. Nicholas Freudenberg, distinguished professor of health at the CUNY, CUNY Graduate Center. Over the last 19 years, I had the absolute pleasure of engaging, engaging with and serving thousands of men and women and young adults who walk through the doors of fortune, hoping for something better, but not sure if better is real and possible. The last 34 years of my life lays the foundation of my work and my commitment to criminal justice reform on the table for this committee to have the confidence to know that I will serve as your voice, your eyes, and advocate on the Board of Correction. While we have experienced amazing reductions and reforms in our criminal justice system, locally, thanks to many on this call, we have so much more to do to ensure equity, fairness, and justice in our system. We have about 4,300 people detained in New York City jails right now. We have a commitment from New York City Council to close Rikers Island, and I thank you for that commitment. A commitment from Mayor de Blasio to end solitary confinement, and we're working on that right now. And a commitment from the City Council to ensure people impacted by the criminal justice system have the resources and supports needed to end the cycle of incarceration.
by addressing homelessness, mental illness, substance abuse, and hopelessness. Imagine what we can do as a system if our corrections department revised their primary mission and vision statement and the Board of Corrections was not seen as an adversary, but rather as a partner and a resource to improve the conditions of confinement. We could move towards a more humane and integrated system of corrections that seeks to support the growth and development and reintegration of people in custody. I am looking forward to continuing the work to ensure we hold these words that guide our approach to criminal justice. Fairness, accountability, redemption, hope, and opportunity. Again, I wanna thank Speaker Johnson and Chairwoman Kaz and the other distinguished committee members here today. And I'll close with this. As I've walked in my journey, I have always thought that my journey was controlled by me. But I have come to learn that my journey has always been con controlled by my higher power. I have been blessed with an amazing wife of 30 years, four amazing children, and nine amazing grandchildren. And my work every single day is to work to ensure that my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren eventually will come to know this city, be a city investing in their future with education and a path towards college and economic stability and not a path toward Rikers Island, a jail and detention. And I have been blessed to walk this journey with an amazing woman, my wife, Satara, who together we're gonna work to make sure that our grandchildren and our great grandchildren see the city for what it truly can be. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start. Uh, we will now open the floor up to the committee for any questions or comments concerning the candidate. Uh, I can't see, is the speaker on? No, Council Member Kozlo, it's okay. the speaker is not on. Okay, then I have a couple of questions. Do you believe that DOC and Correctional Health Services have adequately responded to the COVID-19 pandemic? So I think there are, there are two answers uh, to that question. The first short answer is, um, I think they did an amazing job in responding, but I think the response was slow. It wasn't coordinated and it didn't lay out a blueprint for how Correctional Health Services and the Department of Correction will work together moving forward, both in terms of the pandemic we're in right now and in anticipation for a second wave. So I look at where we were at when we had, I think it was around 5,900 people incarcerated at the time of the pandemic. And we called on the city and the mayor to move swiftly to release those who could be released safely and to get them into services and get them into support. And the mayor did that, which reduced our population, which was the right thing to do. Correctional health moved swiftly to try to identify and set up protocols for ensuring the continued safety of those who had to be detained there. And I think we had a couple of months where we had no positive uh, results stemming from uh, someone being incarcerated. They set up a way for people to come in and be quarantined and tested uh, so that it doesn't spread to the general population. But what they haven't done is articulate what is the plan to manage a second wave. We know they took steps, but what's the plan? And it's not articulated on their website. It wasn't articulated in the hearing that was just held by health and criminal justice. And I think they are missing a huge opportunity. Thank you. 
As a member of the Board of Correction, you voted in favor of rules <clears throat> to limit the use of punitive segregation. But there is still so much more to be done. What do you think are the concrete steps BOC can take to change the culture in DOC facilities? Well, I, I am really uh, excited about what we are going to be proposing. So right now, uh, we are closing out a work group to end punitive seg. We have about 90, uh, 90 some odd people in uh, punitive seg. It is a tool the department uses. And what we're going to be proposing uh, is what all experts call for, right? The model will will eliminate extreme isolation. Uh, the model will include a pathway back into general population. So a person can earn their way back into general population. The reasons for movement out of general population will be very defined. Uh, so everybody will know what they are. And then the goal would be to work with people to understand the underlying issues that, that perpetuated the behavior that harmed somebody and called for the removal from general population. So to work on those underlying uh, issues so that when the person ends up back in general population, they're able to live without harming. So we are wrapping up that work. We are preparing a memo now uh, to the board and the board will be taking those recommendations and incorporating, modifying into the rule package that we hope to be voting on very, very shortly. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Council, has anybody raised their hand? Yes, first of all, we'd like to welcome council members Cornegie, Kalos and Powers, who are not members of the committee, but have joined for the hearing. Uh, and we have a few members who have raised their hand. First, we'll start with members of the Rules Committee. Council Member Adams, do you wish to ask questions of Mr. Richards or uh, later in the meeting about the Board of Elections? Uh, both, actually. Okay, well, <laughs> then you are first for Mr. Richards. Thank you so much, Council. Welcome, Mr. Richards. Thank you, Councilmember. We have not met, but your story is so compelling. Congratulations to you uh, on your story, on your many successes, on your triumphs, uh, and for being with us today. Uh, what a great story, great story. Thank you. Um, I just have um, um, maybe, a, maybe one question, maybe two. Um, my, my, my mother is a retired uh, captain from correction. Correction is very near and dear to my heart. And I know several of my colleagues have heard me say this a million times. Um, my son-in-law is, my son-in-law is an officer. Um, I have a very good friend of mine who is actually um, very high in, in, uh, in DOC. And I'm very concerned about uh, COVID uh, 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 amongst everyone there. Um, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure that I'm convinced that um, CHS and DOC have appropriately handled the situation in the past. I fear that my son-in-law may possibly have COVID for a second time um, at, at this moment. Um, and uh, the person that I mentioned, the other person I'm very close to, got COVID very early on, um, uh, you, you know, around uh, April or so. Um, had to be rushed to the hospital. Thank God she's fine now. But I'm not very sure that I'm convinced that there's a handle on the situation, that there's a handle on the spread, that there is even that, and I hate to put it that way, but I will, that uh, prioritization of concern um, for the pandemic within the system over at Rikers, within the walls um, at Rikers. And uh, I'm, I'm very, very concerned. We mentioned a second wave, but I don't think we ever got out of the first wave. So um, before we can even speak about a second wave, I think that we have to get a handle on the first wave that continues. So I, I think I just need to hear from you again um, in the way that you just articulated it uh, so well. 
just a, a little bit more of your thought on how you will be instrumental to making people like me more comfortable with the situation there um, and, and, and the concern that we have with regard to not just those that are, that are detained, but also our loved ones who are working within those four walls as well. Absolutely, thank you for that, for that question, Councilwoman. And, and you're absolutely right. The role of the board, and we've been playing this role throughout this pandemic, has been to hold the department and CHS accountable. In every one of our monthly meetings, we have COVID-19 on our agenda, and we are asking department, just as the city council has been asking the department, for a comprehensive plan about how they're going to handle COVID. And what we have been saying to them is that we ought to be focusing on the officers and all of the civilians who come into the facility, because the reality of it is, is that we need to ensure that they're okay, because they are connected and they're the ones who's connected to the outside that could potentially bring the, the virus on the inside. So we ought to be having a robust testing program for the officers. We ought to be having a robust isolation and, and support program for the officers. I've heard from the officers, and this is where I hear different from the officers than I hear from the commissioner. Officers say they don't have adequate PPE equipment. And what I hear from the commissioner is that every officer has PPE equipment. What we've seen from Gentech, which is the tool we use to video monitor, We've seen inconsistent usage of the PPE, particularly face mask of officers. We see them with the face mask under their chin or face mask not on. And, and what, what we need to do is to be able to hold the department accountable to ensure that the officers are the ones who are really being tested and being cared for because they pose more of a risk to people on the inside than anybody else because they're going in and out of the facility. And, and you're right, we have not gotten a response from the department to say, here's our robust plan. What they've done is they've, they said they've offered testing to the officers, any officer can get tested, but they should have a much more robust program. It shouldn't be if you, if you wanna get tested. If you're working in the facility where, you, where you're working next to uh, detained people or other civilians, they should have some kind of testing protocol to ensure that people are not uh, uh, transmitting the virus. They ought to make sure that PPE is mandatory. No question about it, you got to wear your mask. And I think the commissioner last week put out a teleorder uh, saying that if officers are found not to wear their mask, they will be um, held accountable. So I think she's taking a, a stronger stance on that. But we ought to be doing that. And that should be laid out in a plan that's presented to the city council, that is presented to the board of corrections. And what we're going to do is we're going to hold them accountable. We're going to make sure it's in the public domain at our hearings. Uh, and we're going to be holding Department of Corrections and CHS accountable for, for ensuring the safety of everyone. Thank you so much um, for that answer. Um, it, it, it Really, if we had more uh, like-minded, thoughtful folks like you uh, present uh, and accounted for um, actually being able to lay this out. Um, people that have come from um, where you have come from, uh, like stories like yours, I think that we would be in much better shape. And I think that a lot of what you just relayed um, is endemic, not just with DOC, but also in NYPD is also, also which we have seen um, in the non-adherence to the protocols. So I thank you again for your testimony and uh, wish you much success. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have council member Powers. And if any other council members wish to ask questions of Mr. Richards, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. Council member Powers. Hi there, nice to see everybody. Thank you for your testimony and nice to see you. We we speak often in our, in our respective roles, but um, wanted to ask you just on the solitary punitive segregation rulemaking, do you have a sense of what the timing might be, what, both from the tail, you're on the task force and the board, so where, uh, what that timing might be looking, looking like when it comes to putting out new rulemaking? Yes, so I am trying to close out the work group uh, work. We're finalizing the memo. I'm hoping to do that by the end of this week. 
hoping to get uh, the recommendations to Chair Austin uh, and the Mayor City Hall by, the, by uh, next week. Uh, the board is working on a timeline to be able to get uh, to review the recommendations, to incorporate those recommendations into the rule package and get that to law uh, for certification uh, sometime uh, early in uh, uh, November. Uh, and then given the public an opportunity to review it as we made that commitment and then uh, signing off on it in sometime in November. Okay, so you'll have a public hearing on that with, uh, I think usually it's like 10 days or 10 days of yes. publish. Okay, thank you for that. Um, uh, I'll only, I, I, a number of colleagues asked my questions already, including uh, Councilor Adams on PPE and COVID preparation and Councilor Kos Chair Kozlowitz with regard to the other issues around peanut segregation. But I'll just add that, you know, uh, 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 I'll add support for uh, Stanley Richards, which is that during my time as the chair of the committee, uh, both as his, his role in the Fortune Society, but also on the task force on computer segregation and as a board member has been, um, we've gone to Rikers Island together, we've taken tours of the facilities together, and it's been a helpful voice and I think a good appointee for this, uh, for this body to have, because I think he takes his job seriously. I think he's thoughtful and he's not one track minded, he really tries to see the various uh, issues from the different stakeholders here. I think he is worth our um, continuing to be our nominee on the board. So I want to add my voice of support for him and uh, I will be planning to vote on him uh, in support of his nomination. Thank you. Chair Kozlowitz, there are no other council members who wish to speak. Okay, thank you. Um, now, uh, thank you, Mr. Richards. We will now move to the Board of Elections. <clears throat> the Board of Elections consists of 10 commissioners, two from each of the city's five counties. Each commissioner serves a term of four years or until a successor is appointed. Commissioners shall be registered voters in the county for which they are appointed and registered as a member of the political party for which they are nominated. New York election law section 3-204 subsection 1 states that at least 30 days before the first day of January of any year in which a commissioner of elections is to be appointed, the chairman or secretary of the appropriate party county committee shall file a certificate of party recommendation with the clerk of the appropriate local legislative body. New York election law section 3-204 subsection 4 states that commissioners of election shall be appointed by the county legislative body or in the, in the city of New York by the city council. It is for this reason that the rules committee is considering this nomination today. The Queens County Board of Elections submitted a valid certificate of party recommendation on October 1st, 2020. This was more than 30 days before the first day of January of a year in which commissioners are appointed. If the council as a whole does not act within 30 days of receiving a valid certificate of recommendation, the applicable political party conference with the, within the council becomes empowered to approve the recommendation on its own. For example, a democratic vacancy would be filled by a vote of the Demo Democratic Party's conference and a Republican vacancy would be filled by a vote of the Republican Party's conference. Finally, New York election law section 3-204 subsection 4 states that if a party fails to file the certificate within the time prescribed by this section, the members of the legislative body who are members of such party may appoint any eligible person to such office. However, in this case, the Queens Democratic Party filed a timely certificate of a rec recommendation. The board and its commissioners are responsible for the maintenance and administration of voting records and elections. The board also exercises 
quasi-judicial powers by conducting hearings to validate nominating petitions of candidates for nomination to elective office. The board is required to make an annual report of its affairs and proceedings to the council. Commissioners receive a $300 per diem for each day's attendance at meetings of the board or any of its committees with the maximum of $30,000 per year. Welcome, Mr. Arajo, and will you please raise your right hand to be sworn in. Good morning. Good morning. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Do you wish to make a statement? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the members of the committee for taking time to consider my nomination for reappointment as the Queens County Democratic Commission for the Board of Elections for the upcoming term. It has been a pleasure to have been the Democratic Commissioner for Queens County since 2008. I've been a part of the board's transition from the lever machines to the election equipment that we have to date. This equipment has improved the voting process for the citizens of New York. During my time with the board, I've been part of a change within the agency, which has improved the availability of a citizen to exercise one of the most important fundamental rights, the right to vote. I believe voting provides an opportunity for a person to express their beliefs, concerns, and ultimately change their future through their choice of elected. In the course of my tenure as the Queens County Democratic Commissioner, I have through my roles in the ballot committee and the public outreach committee advocated changes that have improved the voting process and information to the voter. In addition, the board's implementation of early voting again has served as an overall effort to inform and provide the voter with an opportunity to exercise that right to vote. While this is just a small example of changes that have been instituted since my original appointment, there are countless changes which have effectively made the voting process an easier and successful process. I believe that with the present atmosphere and the courage of the citizens, the possibility of changing the way the vote the way voting is conducted is just beginning. I will have and always have advocated for a process that guarantees confidence in the voting process and in the election results. And I hope to be a part of that mission for the next four years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we're going to go to uh, the floor. We're gonna open the floor up to committee for any questions or comments concerning the candidates starting the speaker, is the speaker here? No, he's not here yet. Okay. Um, then I have a few questions. What steps do you think the Board of Elections should take to ensure the efficient and accurate certification of this November's general election with a large increase in absentee ballots from prior years? I think the board has begin, has begun taking the process of implementing those steps. What we're really talking about is the, the voluminous amount of absentee ballots that we believe will be coming in. As of last Tuesday, as of this Tuesday, excuse me, over 730,000 absentee uh, ballot requests have been made and over 90% of that has been completed and processed by our staff. Uh, we purchased new equipment to allow for the faster canvassing of the, the ballots and sorting of the ballots that actual equipment is being installed in Queens this week. We've also, um, purchased uh, auditing equipment that would allow us to assist in the actual auditing process of the votes. Um, we have also implemented the increased hiring of staff to allow with the canvassing procedures and myself in Queens have actually uh, had numerous conversations with my chief and deputy and my counterpart with respect to steps that we can take to make things and the certification go a lot faster and quicker for the uh, city of New York. I'm not opposed to having consider, consider, to consider other avenues as presented by the executive management in other counties as to how we, we could actually expedite the certification process. Okay. Um, have you seen an increase in voter participation since you've been the commissioner? Well, Absolutely, we have. We've seen a, a large amount of voter participation, um, especially now with social media, uh, the people are really actually advocating with change and the present climate of what's going on in our political environment has attributed and contributed to that. Uh, and it's very appreciated. I mean, we had, when I first started, it was, a, it was I think it was a 20% voter turnout. 
and the numbers have increasingly gone up more and more as each election passes. Okay. And what policies would you suggest to better professionalize poll workers? Um, I, we have within the board had communications with the appropriate agency heads to try to um, take advantage of municipal workers. Um, I think the use of municipal workers, professionalized municipal workers as poll workers would really assist on election day uh, and allow us to implement other things that are already present in the election law like split shifts and things of nature, of that nature. Our biggest problem is actually retaining and employing over 30,000 poll workers on election day and now for early voting. Um, unfortunately, we try to train these, uh, these individuals and sometimes they don't show up for the election site, which creates problems in staffing. I believe the, the, the use of, of municipal workers would assist us in having a set group of individuals who are willing to work on election day that, we can, be count that can be counted on. Thank you. There was a massive vendor error for absentee ballots sent to voters in Kings County. The vendor was selected on a no-bid contract. Do you think the contract selection process should be strengthened to avoid mistakes like this in the future? Uh, I absolutely do believe that the, the contracts um, system should be changed and modernized to allow for such errors not to occur. Um, I had indicated um, to the other commissioners that I would not be opposed to holding this particular vendor uh, really accountable for the mistake that he did other than him paying for the, the, the research, remailing of the ballots. Um, provided that we have other vendors to, uh, to do those services. Thank you. Uh, Council, I'll turn it over to you. Are any hands raised for questions? Yes, Council Member Adams. Thank you so much and welcome, um, Mr. Arajo. Very nice to see you this morning and thank you for your service to BOE. Uh, we know uh, how Everyone loves that job so well. So we thank you so much for your commitment <laughs> to want to continue. Um, my question really re revolves around education and training um, with, with BOE. So I was curious uh, just to dig a little bit more into your response when it comes to legislative reforms, particularly around ranked choice voting, um, and to know your thoughts, uh, your response to the initial question was that um, you believe that the BOE uh, will meet the requirements um, with regard to the implementation of ranked choice voting. And then it says, as we've done with all of our prior obligations with respect to the implementation of changes in the law, i.e. early voting. Early voting is my favorite thing to do in life, by the way. I just wanna put that out there. Um, but with regard again to, uh, to RCV, um, it's noted that the BOE actually missed the charter mandated June 1st, 2020 planning deadline for ranked choice voting. So, um, so that, was, that commitment was not met. So I need some assurance that there will be better education going, uh, going forward uh, and that there will be adherence um, to training and education when it comes to ranked choice voting, which promises to be uh, very perplexing to the voting population. Right, I, I appreciate that question. And I, I agree with your sentiment um, that ranked choice voting is the next step in the frontier of, of the Board of Elections. Um, there is a commitment from my end to make sure that our staff is actually trained um, with respect to the programs and the, the, the process for ranked choice voting. It's my understanding that the executive management and the appropriate management teams have requested an extension of time to meet those th that deadline that you referred to. And in fact, it was uh, met at some, after the extension. It's also my understanding that executive management is actually having current discussions, and I believe there's a meeting set for this week, if not today, definitely tomorrow with the State Board of Elections regarding a ranked choice voting and the implementation thereof. Our, our board has taken pride in taking poll worker training to the next level and employee training to the next level, which specifically with, the, with poll workers, we've actually started online training courses for election day and other procedures that we need. And we hope to implement that as well with ranked choice voting as we become more familiarized with the program and exactly what's gonna happen for us. But I do fully expect that we'll be implementing it coming up in 2021. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the explanation. I appreciate that. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you. 
Council, is there anyone else? Yes, Council Member Rose. Hi, how are Hi. you? <laughs> good morning. How are you? Um, you can see how good I am on Zoom. I forgot to unmute. Um, I, I want to thank you, you know, for your service to um, the Board of Elections, especially during, you know, some very trying times. You know, my concern, um, besides rank voting, um, is the fact that uh, we've seen um, when there is an increase in volume that uh, the Board of Elections um, often experiences, you know, difficulties. And um, the volume uh, promises to be, you know, much higher than we've seen in previous elections. And um, I, I just want to understand, you know, um, it seems like when we introduce new equipment into um, the, the process that um, we experience glitches and errors and, um, and things that I feel could have been avoided had we um, added these, you know, the equipment or whatever in a, in a more timely manner. What safeguards have have been put in place to ensure that um, the increased uh, machines that you you brought in to count the um, the the increase in ballots, you know, what insurances do we have that we're not going to have some sort of fiasco um, like we saw in you know a previous election? Um, what safeguards are there, uh, especially when we introduce? Um, new equipment and things into the process, you know, pretty late. I don't know what happened. I had it on. Is it the computer or is it the link? To, to answer your question, I believe the equipment that we've been putting in, clear ballot has actually was put in after the June election. So we had enough time to work out some of the issues that may come across with that, with that equipment. However, it's my understanding that all equipment that the board um, owns or purchases is certified uh, or, or has to be certified by an appropriate agency, and I believe in this case would be the state board. The board puts out a contract for the requirements, and then based on that equipment that we receive, it should have already been certified, my belief, by the state board uh, to make sure that the equipment is, uh, is going to serve its purpose. Um, unfortunately, like most things, when you, when, you when you purchase it, you start realizing what the issues are. But I believe with appropriate staffing and having technicians who are familiar with the equipment, and most of our contracts do include that uh, a service contract uh, with the vendor to troubleshoot problems that we may have with the equipment as it's happening. Well, um, I, I'm hoping that you know we we don't experience any of of those issues. Um, I, I'm hoping that you know the troubleshooting has taken place prior to you know. Of uh, this the the election, um, I also uh, I'm concerned about rank choice voting, um, uh, as is my colleague uh, Adrian Adams, and and the education of the public, and and when is that going to happen? It's quite a complex situation, and it's often it's it's one that's difficult for those of us who are a bit conversant with, you know, with the process. So um, uh, is there a timeline for when this um, information is going to get out to the public? And, and um, how are we going to, you know, sort of educate them uh, on this process? Uh, we, uh, as a board of 10 commissioners, we haven't been briefed yet by executive management with respect to the the public outreach portion of the ranked choice voting. Uh, however, I do expect, as we have done in the past with the DS200s and any new equipment that comes out, we, we hold public meetings where we try to inform the public as much as possible. We do have uh, our website, which actually provides as much information as possible. Um, and we're actually starting to implement the use of videos to explain things to people. I, I was just on the website this morning and I, I saw a whole bunch of different videos regarding the absentee ballot, tracking your ballot, 
we're, the, the board is taking more of a position where we're trying to inform the public as much as possible through as many avenues as possible. We've, we've accepted and, and encompassed the use of social media and I believe that that would probably be part of our messaging, um, uh, messaging uh, protocol. And we do have a public outreach committee that, that that responsibility falls upon them to make recommendations to us, the rest of the commissioners, as to how we should proceed with that. And I, I do believe that's part of their agenda, as I heard uh, some colloquy with respect to wanting to do that. Um, with the uh, the advent of COVID and, and the need to social distance, that has created some um, challenges for the Board of Elections in terms of space. Um, are we are we prepared to handle the volume of people that we um, anticipate coming out to vote and and still being able to maintain you know the social distancing requirements? Yes, right now in the city of New York we have over, we're going to have over 1,200 po uh, poll sites. We have over 88 early voting sites. We're hoping that people will avail themselves to using the early voting sites for those that period of time and allow for social distancing. In addition, the high volume of absentee requests will also assist with that. Um, and, and we've taken the appropriate measures within the poll site as we actually conducted an election in March, which was canceled and we did the June primary. And we, uh, we were able to allow and, and uh, allow our poll workers to work safely and also protect the public. Um, so I, I do believe we've implemented those things. We've seen what works and what hasn't worked. And we're actually changing that to, to try to make things better. And also, I just as a side note, the, the board is also um, publicizing the use through our website and in our meetings, the use of the, pass, the fast pass and also the card that we're sent in the mailer to allow for more contactless voting. Um, and we're encouraging these things as much as possible and also in the hopes of expediting the line process. Hope you just remind people to actually open that because traditionally people just kind of disregard it. Guard it. Um, I, I think there should be some special attention paid to remind people to actually go in there because there's, you know, the fast pass is, you know, a part of that mailer. Um, and my last question is, you know, um, about uh, are, what are we doing to ensure the public about the integrity of the safety of the absentee um, ballots and, um, the integrity of, of the, the absentee ballots? Well, the canvassing procedure is actually open to elected officials, uh, candidates, and open to the public and the press. Uh, we also have poll watches that appear, and regularly these things are actually covered by the press. And I expect that they will be covered again uh, because it, this election is such an important election. Um, but the process is actually open uh, to the public, and the process is covered under the election law and the state procedures. Um, and the process is the process, uh, you know, and it's, it's as open as transparent as can be. And we try to make sure and allow for access to the public to watch us as we canvass the ballots. And we actually provide notice to, to everyone and our website of the dates of the canvassing and the location of the canvassing. Well, thank you um, so much. I just want you to reassure them that, you know, um, that the absentee uh, ballot process um, is you'll be able to maintain the integrity of it. So no, thank you so much. Thank you very much. We want to welcome the speaker yes. uh, to this hearing who's now Absolutely. joined. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the next council member who has their hand raised is council member Kalos. Mr. Speaker, of course, if you have any questions, uh, the chair would like to recognize you. No other speakers? Council Member Kalos. Council Member Kalos. Uh, good morning. I want to thank Council Member Karen Koskowitz for chairing the Rules Committee as well as her leadership of the Queen's delegation. I appreciate her having me as a guest on the committee today. As we hear a reappointment for Democratic Commissioner to the Queen's Board of Elections, I had five questions. Councilmember Adams and Rose asked my questions on ranked choice voting, so I hope to get through four remaining quickly as Chair Koswitz runs a tight ship. Uh, so the first 
Uh, do you support using technology to improve access to voting? In particular, I authored Local Law 65 of 2016, survived an absentee ballot tracker, which took four years to implement, and Local Law 238 of 2017 for online voter registration, which has not been implemented. Why haven't my laws been implemented timely or at all, and will you commit to do so? Uh, I, I will commit to do so. Um, I, I do believe that those change those requests or, or, or changes in the law will ultimately benefit and have benefit as evidenced in the June primary and in this primary uh, to avail the voters an opportunity to actually exercise their right to votes. Um, uh, the, the reason for the delay for the online voter registration was a partisan issue that ran all the way up from the state board where the board of commissioners, the city board of commissioners could not get a legal op an opinion uh, for or against a a, a technical issue, whether or not a signature needed a wet signature requirement or a signature was sufficient in the form captured by the electronic process. Uh, I believe that the executive order signed by the governor uh, in this last uh, election took that out of the equation and then allowed us to implement um, the absentee ballot tracking and ballot requests. And as indicated earlier, we have over 730,000 uh, absentee ballot requests, and we're in the process of, of getting those out to the public as soon as possible, and we're over 90% compliance with respect to that. I'm all for uh, online registration in, in as many places as possible, and uh, the board accepting that and mandating that through our process as long as we're able to provide verification for the information of the voter, um, I'm 100% for that. The Board of Elections is widely criticized for its patronage. I've authored introduction 1248 of 2016, which would mandate posting jobs so that anyone can apply. Regardless of if I'm able to pass this legislation, would you commit to posting all jobs at the Queen's Board of Elections? Uh, the jobs at the Board of Elections, as the council members are aware, are created through the New York State Constitution. Uh, it, the jobs have to, the, the Board of Elections has to have an equal representation of both Democratic and Republican uh, members in order to ensure a fair process. Um, I have instituted as a Democratic commissioner within my, pol within my borough, um, the avail availability to hire as many qualified people as possible. We look at different avenues to obtain those candidates from uh, nominations from the party organization, through the internet, through uh, newspaper uh, requests or, or advertisement for technical positions from poll workers, from existing workers. So I, I believe that I have instituted and the board will institute uh, if, if a majority of the commissioners so desire, uh, I have in included a robust uh, avenue of, of obtaining qualified candidates for positions with the board of elections. Um, I don't Presently, the board actually does have on their website a job vacancy, and we do list our technical positions. Um, I, I'm not for, at this moment, um, putting the jobs on the city website. Um, as I stated before, I believe the state board is run by the Constitution, and um, I don't believe that we should be advertising our jobs on the state, on, excuse me, on the city website. However, I, I am for putting our jobs on the board's website and ensuring a fair process in the hiring and a standardized uh, qualification for all employees and a, a standardized review of that application, meaning the, the determination of whether or not someone's qualified should not be ad hoc based on different counties. Um, in addition to alleviate the, the question of nepotism, um, I have instructed in Queens County, my chief and the appropriate manager to actually do the interviews of the resumes and of the potential candidates and then make a recommendation to me and my Republican counterpart for that person's job. And, and I have on occasion, uh, they have on occasion not recommended in regards of where they came from. And I've actually not hired uh, county uh, candidates uh, for that purpose. And also, in addition, I also have vacancies, a limited amount of vacancies in the general office. And whenever I've uh, submitted a request for someone to be uh, re interviewed, I then allow the appropriate manager in that general office to make that interview and make a recommendation to myself. Uh, so I rely heavily on, oh, absolutely on the recommendation of my chief and or managers on the hiring process. Uh, thank you, and you touched on it in, in, the pre, in your previous answer, but the Department of Investigations found incidents of nepotism at the Board of Elections, including a violation of 
some of the conflicts of interest board for you yourself. Can you share what happened and whether you paid the fine and would you commit to following and enforcing the city's anti nepotism policy? Absolutely. I, I am 100% for enforcing the rules. Um, in, in 2012, as I was getting close to my reappointment, I was informed by uh, Mr. Davis, Chuck Davis, uh, whether or not I had received a waiver for hiring uh, Rita Arajo, my spouse, as a temporary employee. Um, upon notification that I needed a waiver, I immediately fired her since I did not have the waiver. Um, and again, this came up as part of the reappointment process. Um, subsequently, sometime after, I think it was a year or two afterwards, I, I actually uh, entered into a disposition with the campaign finance board. I paid the fine and I readily admit that I was, unfortunately, I, I made a mistake. Um, and I was, unfortunately, that mistake was relied on based on the information given to me by the personnel director at that time that it was, it was fine. Ultimately, the responsibility was mine to do a little bit more due diligence. As a result of that, um, I have encouraged and it, we have created processes to try to prevent other commissioners or other employees from making the mistake that I made. Uh, we now provide the policy and procedures to not only the, the hired staff, but new commissioners now receive that. I never got a policy and procedure guide as I became a commissioner. I made sure that new commissioners now get that so they don't make the same mistake. In addition, when I was the president of the board in 2014, we again reaffirmed our uh, procedures with respect to anti-corruption and nepotism and post, and we actually post those, our procedures are posted on the website. Um, our, I also have implemented the use of a questionnaire in the hiring process in Queens County, which has incorporated some of the rec recommendations by, C, uh, by the DOI in their report. Thank you. My last question, I thank the chair for her indulgence. Most elections in New York City have few lines, but every four years we have presidential elections and the number one complaint is long lines. And during a pandemic that could be a serious deterrent to voting, what will you do as commissioner to eliminate these long lines? Would you support splitting up so-called super poll sites? Do you have other solutions or proposals? Uh, the issue with the super poll sites is, as, as uh, the board has made abundantly clear, is the availability to have accessible poll sites where we could uh, reduce the number of EDs. Uh, I'm always open to finding as many poll sites that are accessible and ADA compliant to allow that to happen. But the immediate steps that we've taken right now is um, the use of the fast pass, the information card. We've actually hired, uh, the, the board has a plan to hire line managers who will pull people out of the line and send them to the ED8, the correct ED8 table in order so that they could vote. They will, you know, we, we've done with uh, early voting, we've used that as a step to allow us to try to reduce the amount of people coming out on election day. The absentee ballots, of course, uh, will also reduce that amount, but we're totally committed to trying to reduce that number and have that, that wait time way below the recommendation and requests of, of various parties. Those are my questions, thank you. Chair Kozlowitz, there are no other council members who wish to speak. Okay. And with that, unless uh, we're going to ask for a roll call from the clerk. Good morning, William Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote committee on rules, privileges, and elections on M255 and M256, which are coupled, Chair Kozlowitz. Uh, can I explain my vote? I just want to say I, I vote aye for both candidates, and I just want to say to... Uh, Jose Arajo, it's a pleasure. You serve Queens very well. I voted for you in 2017 and I'm voting for you now. And I, I won't be here the next time to vote for you, sorry. But I vote aye on both. Thank you. Mario. I'm voting respectfully no on 255, 1467 and yes on the other, thanks. I'm sorry, Councilman, can you go one more time? My apologies. Can you hear me, Billy? Yeah, my apologies. One more uh, time. I'm sorry. That's okay. No one, 255, 1467. Okay. And I and the other one. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Lanceman. Yes. Rose. Yes, I on both. Torres. Can you go? Trent. 
Traeger. Uh, Adams. Congratulations to Mr. Richards and Mr. Arojo. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Speaker Johnson. I vote aye on both. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, M255 is adopted by the uh, by the committee, five in the affirmative, one of the negative in really? abstention. Yes. Um, can we, Council Member Traeger will be joining us shortly. Okay, I can, I want to wait or announce, I can announce the vote now and call him later or I could wait. Oh, he's coming in on now. What? Okay. Why don't we hold the vote open? <clears throat> Let me see. I'm looking for Traeger. He's not on. Mr. Clerk? Yes. We may have Councilmember Torres back. And Councilmember. <laughs> yes. Councilmember Torres? Hold on. Thank you. Councilmember Traeger? Uh, yes, and I, I appreciate the chair's uh, and, and the committee's time. I simultaneously have a call with Dr. Long uh, with regards to testing strategy in schools so all at the same time, so, so my apologies. I just wanted just to uh, thank the chair, uh, Karen Kosowitz, and, 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 and the entire committee for their, for their work and making sure that folks have an opportunity to, to get the information which they have. I just wanted just before I vote, just reemphasize again the importance of language access, the importance of interpreters at, at poll sites, including Russian speaking. Uh, this has been an issue that's deeply, deeply personal to me and the folks I represent. Um, and I, I really just want to underscore that. Uh, and with that, I do vote aye. And I thank the chair again uh, for her leadership and for her time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. M255 with a vote of seven in the affirmative, one in the negative and no abstentions, and M256 with a vote of eight in the affirmative, zero in the negative and no abstentions. Both items have been adopted by the committee. Thank you. Thank you. This 